Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, thank you for coming to Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. The alchemic ability of blown glass to transition between liquid and solid states has been fascinating sculptors for millennia. One of them is New Orleans artist James Vella, whose stunningly realistic glass trout and delicate orchids demonstrate the striking versatility of blown glass as a medium. The manager of Yaya's glass blowing program talked about what keeps him facing the fire. Blowing glass is one of the oldest art forms in the world. And the coolest thing about it for me is that if you took a 16th century Italian master and brought him into my studio today, he would recognize every single tool and every single piece of equipment. And that's how little it's changed throughout the years. With the exception of technology and with the exception of better combustibility from higher heats and easier way to heat things up, the art form hasn't changed in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And to me, that's one of the most embracing aspects of it. It's like you're carrying on a handmade tradition. Though it's rare, has been around forever. I started out as a wildlife painter and I went to college 100% as a football player. And throughout my life, I had a strong appreciation for art but I also found a love for painting and drawing. And when I was in college playing football, for lack of a better word, I was forced to find ways to get good grades because I couldn't study as much. I had a lot of responsibilities towards football that took me away from academia. So I took advantage of the fact that I was a good painter and drawer, and I enrolled in painting classes. So my undergraduate work at Hastings College in Hastings, Nebraska was in wildlife painting. I became obsessed with photorealism painting. Below my painting studio was the hot glass studio. I'm like, wow, man, they're listening to music. They're working as a team. It's hot as heck down there. They're sweating. They're using every muscle in their body, muscles they never thought they would ever have to use in their lives. And when they're done with the piece, man, we got high fives, we got hugs, hey, we can do better next time. And I was like, oh dear God, that's football in art. And I was like, I've hit the jackpot here. So I started learning glass. And the thing about glass is, it's so difficult to do. And it's so difficult to learn. And it takes so much practice and dedication and like reading a book, I've been practicing that, those kinds of disciplines my whole life in sports. And I was like, wow, this is an emergence of two things that I love more than anything, and I'm gonna embrace this and make it my life. I was very fortunate to have a lot of mentors who really pounded that down my throat. Use your skills to make art. Don't use your skills to show everyone what your skills are and I really take that to heart. Full circle to the beginning of the story, as I started sculpting more and more, I had the same passions for representing nature in my glass. And that started with fish and birds and Louisiana seafood was just like perfect for me. And then that evolved into my love for gardening. And I was like, well, I can represent that in glass as well. And I would have to say that I'm probably most known for my rather large oversized flowers, mostly orchids. And I've kind of just stayed in that realm of nature and beauty for the sake of beauty and nature for the sake of nature. The technical aspects of the birds, it's pretty straightforward. We blow a little bubble, which would be the body of the bird. We sift on the color 
in a rather painterly fashion. And then the wings and the beaks and the eyes, those are all added separately. I like to put the hot bit of glass on and then I'll sculpt that bit into what I want and lay it down. You can do that with various coloring and various texture to give it the look of being more like a bird wing. And the same with the beak. You add the beak onto the face and then you sculpt the beak into what it should be. Two things that are really important to me is mouths and eyes. On almost any living thing that I would ever sculpt, I, I personally believe that the mouth and the eyes are the two most important characteristics that you have to portray. You know, color and shape are obviously important, but mouth and eyes. Mouth shows you how this fish eats. The mouth shows you that that's the type of fish that it is. The eyes show you that it's a predator. So when you make them in a movement that represents them hunting or looking for prey or food, it makes them look more realistic. We're doing it all hot. So hot glass sticks to hot glass perfectly. And so once you get the body figured out, you put the wings on, you add the wings hot, you pinch them out, you pull them, you sculpt them into a good wing and you lay them down on the side, do the other wing, same with the beak, same with the eye. We use a lot of tools that give us the best control of the glass we can get without burning ourselves. And for majority of glass blowers, if not all, these two fingers are the closest that we come to the glass on a daily basis. Almost everything that we would ever make uses these two fingers. I've been doing this for so many years and I've lost a lot of the sensitivity in these two fingers. They callous over really nice and you end up with what we call glass blowing hands. We have a furnace that holds about 500 pounds of molten glass and that stays at about 2,160 degrees pretty much always. It runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We shut it down probably once a year for about a month to do maintenance. The thing about it is that it's so hot. When you get something that hot, it could take seven to eight days for it to ever to cool off enough that you could actually work on it. And then it's gonna take another additional five to six days to bring it back up to temperature. Because in the meantime, everything is subject to thermal shock. For that reason, we keep it on. We used to buy the raw materials to make glass and then melt them ourselves. So we would turn what looked like maybe rock salt, crystals of the, all the chemicals that went into making good glass. We'd put it in our furnace, we'd heat it up to 2400 degrees, cook it overnight, and the next morning, voila, we had molten glass. Nowadays, most people buy glass that has already been melted and it comes in little medallion form, we call cullet. That's what we load our furnace with. It takes far less energy to melt, but we have solid rods where we can just scoop the glass out of this furnace about the consistency of honey. And we can scoop it onto a solid rod and we can sculpt that glass just as a sculptural material, solid. Or we can gather it up on a, what's called a blowpipe. And the blowpipe is hollow and that allows us to put a bubble in and create a hollow form bowls, plates, vases, and then also allows you to sculpt a bubble. So you can have solid sculpting or you can have blown sculpting where you blow a hollow bubble inside of the molten glass and then you can sculpt that glass into whatever shapes you need it to be. We work the glass so hot that the majority of the colors that we use are gonna read right off the bat as red or a, an orange and that's because they're so hot. And as they cool off, closer and closer to that 1,000 to 1,200 degree mark is when you're gonna really start seeing their true colors. And then when it comes out in the morning from the annealer, you'll see the actual color that it'll be. A lot of people are like, how long did it take you to make that crab? And when my answer is half an hour, they're like, wow, it shouldn't be worth that much money. So I correct that by saying that the amount of time it takes to make that is half an hour and 30 years or 30 years and a half an hour if it happens to be good the first try i benefit from that but it may have taken me four tries to make a beautiful sculpture and whether the attempt that you make to sculpt something fails at the very beginning or at the very last step 
putting it away, you still have to start over. And once the glass has been contaminated with color, it's not even reusable in the furnace. We use only clear glass in the furnace so that we can add our color as we sculpt. I had my own glass studio here in New Orleans. We started in 1996, 97. The exhaustion of having your own small business and trying to keep yourself afloat as an artist, it was a lot of pressure. And an opportunity came at Yaya to be their glass studio manager, and I jumped on it. Two things that I've always loved in life are glass and teaching. So when I had a chance to do that in my own hometown, I jumped at it. What Yaya is is a nonprofit after school art program from kids throughout the city. And they come here after school, they're a part of a community. We teach them entrepreneurial skills through art, we teach them business skills through art, and we also put a very strong emphasis on art through art. They're given many opportunities here. There's a ceramics program, there's a mixed media program, there's computer graphics, textiles, you name it. If we can expose our yayas to any material, any new learning experience, we are all on board all the time. And I find it every single bit as rewarding and enjoyable as the best of my previous career.